So um, this is a talk uh, uh, that the title I finally converged to is Foundation Models, Generative Models and Inverse Problems. I want to highlight that this is based on uh, collaborations uh, with many teams uh, for the various projects I will be presenting. So the first part is with the data comp team uh, that's been led by Ludwig uh, Schmidt at uh, University of Washington. And all the parts are with our amazing students and also our collaborators here in UT and also uh, at MIT and uh, uh, in our institute, uh, IFML, which is the Institute for the Foundations of uh, Machine Learning. So the thing that uh, you know, I want to talk about first is uh, foundation models. And uh, everybody knows now, you know, foundation models like ChatGPT, which is a generative model for language. But for us, uh, I've cared more about images. So the model, the first foundation model that I started working on was StyleGAN2. Uh, but now, of course, uh, diffusions are performing uh, very well, and there's also much more investment into making them better. So DALI2, Stable Diffusion. Uh, and, and other foundation models that are not generative, like CLIP and many others. So uh, some of the foundation models are generative, like StyleGAN, GPT, and DALI, but some foundation models can be classifiers, like CLIP, or they can give you features of images, like Dino. So the, a model being a foundation model is not about it being generative or not, but rather if you can use it for multiple uses as opposed to a single use. Uh, the other characteristic is that these foundation models are trained at billion scale data sets as opposed to million scale. And they need huge infrastructure, huge, uh, you know, they have huge costs and huge data sets. Uh, most foundation models, unfortunately, are closed. It depends what closed exactly means, but clo either the weights are closed or the code is closed or they cannot be used commercially. All these are variations. And this is a key problem, I, I think, in the uh, artificial intelligence ecosystem if we want to have a competitive AI ecosystem both for uh, companies and for uh, research uh, universities and research labs. So in our institute in IFML uh, we're doing two things. Uh, first we are creating new foundation models or doing some work to create new and better foundation models and I will talk about this and specifically the effort I will talk about is data comp uh, which is basically the new lion and uh, the second effort that uh, we are doing, that I will spend most of my time here, is what I call teaching foundation models new tricks. So you, you're going to start with a foundation model, but you want to solve inverse problems with it. Maybe the model can only generate images, or you want to teach it new concepts like generating images of your dog or generating MRI images, even though it was trained on uh, like stable diffusion on, on images on the internet, improve its consistency, accelerate inference, and very, various other things. So these are kind of the two big uh, efforts that we have. So first, I want to talk about the big trend. And uh, the paradigm you know, we had before was that, OK, you want to solve your MRI problem, or you want to solve some super resolution or deep learning problem. Uh, you train your model to do that, right? So to do that, you need a lot of compute and a lot of data. And we can do that to some extent. Uh, but unless we have very massive infrastructure and very big teams, it's a very challenging thing that, that we have all been facing, especially in academia. Uh, the other thing that we are finding is that the models that we do end up training uh, problems specifically are fragile. Okay? So this fragility, John also talked about it, and we have been working with, with uh, John for, for a long time on this. This fragility manifests itself in various ways. The classical example for recognition uh, was the spurious feature. So there was this classical example that you can train a very good classifier for animals, but all the training set camels are in the desert. So every time it sees an animal in the desert, it would say it's a camel, but a camel in the forest, for example, or, or a camel uh, you know, in a different background would, be, would not be recognized, right? Uh, and uh, other version of Fragility that's more relevant to us, as John also mentioned, is fragility is to changes in the distribution of the images. For example, lighting conditions or camera types or imaging protocols or resolutions or scanner types and so on. So many people, uh, including John, Anastasio, uh, and uh, our own group have shown uh, aspects of this fragility. And there has been a lot of work on, on you know, making these models robust. 
Uh, and the central dogma in my lab uh, for a very long time has been that the way we're going to deal with this is to separate the foundation model that learns the statistics of your images from how you solve your inverse problems. So your physics and your forward operators and all that stuff are going to be baked into this but this is only going to learn how your images, the images you care about, look like. And, you know, when John joined UT Austin, uh, I was very excited. We started talking and so on, and he started telling me we're going to train this, we're going to train that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's my central dogma. I want to kind of start building from foundation models. Back then, it was StyleGAN2, but, of course, the fusions came out after that. But this is still the, the kind of the most central point that I truly believe in. Uh, and I'm not saying that we don't train. Uh, we train on our, on our data sets, but I say it's always better to start building from a foundation model. And back then in, in, uh, in 2017, uh, this was, as far as I know, the first kind of uh, version of this that we did in 2017 with the compressed sensing using generative models framework uh, by Bora et al, where we said we're going to start with StyleGAN2 because we couldn't afford to train StyleGAN2 ourselves or anything even nearly competitive. So we said, okay, let's just use optimization uh, in the latent space to solve any inverse problem and not bake the forward operator in our, in our training process. Uh, and this is important, I believe, because it allows us researchers to ride the wave of improving foundation model. And this wave, when I was started, this, uh, started doing this stuff in, in 2017, um, this was StyleGAN2. So it was, you know, a, a few million dollars uh, of investment from, from big organizations. But now this wave is infinitely bigger than when it was back then because the, uh, the effort that's going in training the foundation models now is actually, as I'm hearing, in the billions of dollars, not in the millions of dollars. So th this wave is, is infinitely more pronounced now. So I think that we can, do, we can have very big impact by teaching these very expensive uh, investments to do new tricks to solve our problems. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our effort on creating foundation models. The first thing is the Lion data set. So that's an incredibly important uh, contribution. It was not done by me, but some IFML contributors had a role in this. The Lion data set is, a, is a 5 billion images and captions. It's an image caption pair created from the internet. And it started with common crawl, which is a crawl of the whole internet, basically. But most of, most of the internet, as you may expect, the images and the alt text that's in the HTML, that's what was scraped, the alt text is not a very good description of the image, okay? So the problem of creating these massive uh, foundation data sets that are then used to build stable diffusion and all the models are really problems about data set curation, okay? So filtering images and caption pairs that are a good fit, I, which means the text describes the image, is what was used to create line. So data set creation at the billion scale, at the foundation model scale, is actually a data set filtration problem. And Lion, uh, after, after it was built and was made public and, and available for commercial purposes, has been used to train numerous foundation models, like Stable Diffusion is, is the most relevant for us, but also OpenClip and numerous other uh, projects that are having a huge impact in the AI ecosystem today. Uh, it won the NeurIPS uh, Best Paper Award in the Datasets track, and I think it's very important. So what we are doing now is creating the next Lion dataset, a better Lion dataset, and that's called Datacon. And there was another idea that we had. Uh, instead of just creating a better dataset, the largest public multimodal dataset, we thought that we'll make it a competition, okay? So it's not about us doing all the work. And you know, there's like 40 students and, and many other people from the open source community working on this. So it's a huge project, Datacon. But in, in addition to that, we thought let's make it a competition. So the way the competition works is we give you a pool of billions of image caption pairs. Most of the data is not very good. And the only thing that a participant in this competition is supposed to do is select a subset of data of high quality. So in doing this filtering, we use AI models, like the classical uh, uses clip. We use clip filtering, but many more intelligent AI models are used to select, select this data set subset that will be used later for training. So what we did is we basically did the tooling. And it sounds trivial. It's just a training code and a curation of a data set. 
but it's actually involved a, a, a very large amount of engineering to create a very good fixed training code. And then we also created an evaluation benchmark, a battery of more than 30 uh, downstream tasks that will be used to evaluate how good is the filtration. Uh, so we also detected and blurred faces, which made this Lion 2 uh, usable by many companies, because many companies couldn't even use Lion because Lion has a lot of personally identifying information, and that's against their, their internal terms and conditions. So Datacomp AI is public right now. There are multiple participants from multiple universities. Uh, and, uh, you know, we hope to build a community around this. We hope to have workshops and so on on this dataset filtration and dataset curation uh, problems. Uh, the key contributions, as I said, is uh, that creating Lion and Datacomp has had an impact already. It's used by Apple, Anthropic, Stability, notably for Stable Diffusion and many others. And uh, another key contribution that we're thinking about with John is creating foundation models for MRI. So creating very large data sets using, for example, the Facebook uh, MRI uh, data set as the beginning, but I think there's an additional opportunity here for improving this. Uh, and uh, as I said, the second part is, okay, fine, this is one effort, but uh, how do we actually do our old classical research when we have, you know, one or two PhD students and we still want to leverage this pre-trained model, but we want to we wanted to do something it was not uh, trained to do. So I call this teaching foundation models new tricks. Specifically, I'll, I'll talk about how to solve inverse problems using a pre-trained latent diffusion model, specifically stable diffusion. And then I will also talk about how to enforce consistency in diffusion generative models. So it, once stable diffusion has been trained, fixing it with a little bit of extra training with an extra loss and improving its performance. Uh, and uh, the high level kind of idea I show my students is when you're training your own model, you're playing, you're playing with a toy airplane. And that's, a, that's good research. Like you can discover how to make your toy airplane, for example, land in the water. But when you're working with something like stable diffusion, uh, you're working with an airplane like this. So if you make this airplane land in water, that's a, very, that's a much harder engineering problem than making this airplane land in water. But if you can make this land in water, many more people are likely to use it. Okay? And also, when this tomorrow gets better, your algorithm will still be relevant. So that's kind of the general research direction we have in my lab. Uh, and the way, the tools, the technical tricks that we use is basically of two flavors. One idea is to expose some intermediate layers uh, and correctly fine-tune them. And this is a very interesting area because fine-tuning sounds like a trivial thing, just, just run the training on this big model. But exposing some intermediate wires and doing only a small amount of, of fine-tuning so that you don't break this big airplane but you still allow it to develop a new capability has a lot of interesting methodological and algorithmic work. And the second thing is coming up with different losses. For example, adding consistency terms that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to specifically talk about in painting with stable diffusion. This is our PSLD work and the consistency work. I won't have time to talk about ambient diffusion, but the idea there is can you fine tune or train, but ideally fine tune stable diffusion on a new data set when the, data, the new data that comes is corrupted. Okay, So you want to learn the clean distribution, but the, uh, the given data is corrupted. And then this multi-resolution idea where, which relates to textual inversion that I'll briefly talk about in the end. So, uh, yes. Is there a question? It's fine to take questions in the middle too. No. Sorry, I heard some. Okay. Uh, I, I'm also monitoring the chat, but I can uh, go on. So these are the references. This is our PSLD paper. Uh, and uh, this is our consistency paper. Uh, these are all recent and um, I'm pointing the links and this is our ambient uh, diffusion work. So I'll start by describing uh, the PSLD paper, uh, unless there are any questions. All right. So this is uh, the foundation model we're working with. It's stable diffusion. It has, uh, it has been trained on Lion, as we said. And uh, it's basically a diffusion model in a latent space. And that creates a few algorithmic issues. So a latent diffusion model uses first an autoencoder that you can see here, this is the autoencoder here, to take pixels, go in a latent Z, run the diffusion in the latent space, and then reconstruct the image back using the decoder. And this can be trained separately, pre-train the autoencoder, and then worry about training the diffusion. There are many reasons to do latent diffusions. 
It's much faster and much more memory efficient compared to pixel space diffusion models as we are finding, but there are also foundation models now that are pixel space uh, st um, diffusion models, like deployed IF is kind of the best one that I know of. So stable diffusion right now is a state of the art out of the open models, uh, and as I said, was trained on Lion, and, and it can create great images, but we want to solve inverse problems like in painting or MRI with this, right? So that's the question. So in painting, uh, as, as you all know, this is a group of experts, so you know, we're given an image, and the challenge here is we're not given an image of a face that's correctly centered as we were doing in StyleGAN 2, or a face from you know, CIFAR 10 that's like a, a toy data set, but rather we are in open domain. I literally can take a photograph of my room and, and delete some pixels, and I would like to in-paint them like this. So you can see here the in-painting problem. And these are actual results from our algorithm. So given an image with missing pixels, we want to complete the pixels to preserve the statistics of the image. And we're going to follow, as I said, the central dogma of separating the learning of the images. Somebody else has done that, stable diffusion. And we're going to only use an algorithm to do the in-paint. And, and actually, our algorithm would generalize to all linear inverse problems uh, in a straightforward way. So the foundational idea is that the encoder is a many-to-one mapping, okay? There are multiple images, X, that map to the same latent vector Z. And then the diffusion uh, is happening in the latent space uh, ZT. And the problem is, of course, now you have measurements, right? So you also get to observe, I think I have the annotation here, so this is kind of your problem. You're observing a natural image, but you don't get to look at the pixels. You see a forward operator that is a matrix here, possibly plus noise. So you have your Y, and you don't want to just generate a random image, you want to use Y, right? So there has been a lot of great work in this space, notably DDRM and DPS uh, by uh, you know, John Schultz, yes, uh, group uh, in KAIST. Uh, um, it's a great, uh, a great uh, group that you have there. Congratulations on the organizers on building everybody. That's why I wanted also to take the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, and the, you know, the standard ways you want to use the conditional reverse uh, SDE. And of course, this is the problem, right? How do you estimate this, this uh, uh, conditional score? And uh, we can use the DPS trick. Uh, by Yes Group, which is a, uh, an excellent uh, algorithm that we're using very much in my lab right now. But we discovered that when we use the DPS algorithm to perform the diffusion in the latent space, uh, we get bad latent vectors, okay? So there are, there's some part of the space, so as this diffusion is happening here in the latent space, it leads to some bad vectors that end up producing bad reconstructions in the end. So this is a real experiment we did. We took uh, some real images. These are just images from the internet that I found. Uh, they're not in the training set and they're not in Lion, as far as I know. They, especially, I think this one is more recent. Uh, so I removed some pixels, so you can see here the in-painting problem. And you can see that when we run the previous state of the art, uh, which is running the DPS algorithm using stable diffusion as a prior, uh, we get some uh, somewhat bad reconstruction. You can see here in the faces of the people that it's actually not doing very well. It's doing reasonably well in in-painting the sand, but it's not very good in the faces. I want to emphasize here that DPS was not an algorithm created to work in, this, in the latent space, right? So we're using, we're using DPS uh, off-label here, but that was kind of a straightforward first thing to do. So, and this is happening, as I said, because there are some bad latents that are being produced by the diffusion. And this was kind of our key idea in this PSLD paper. The first thing to realize is that an autoencoder, as you all know, is trained uh, with this objective, right? You want an image after it is encoded to produce a Z, and after that Z is decoded to match or be very close to the original image. This is how the autoencoder is trained. But then you can also think about this interesting uh, property, that you want the decoded Z so once you have a latent Z, you decode it, you get an image, and you autoencode that, and you get a Z back. That may not be the same Z. So the question is, is this condition enforced? What we discovered in our research, and I'm not going to get into details, but we discovered that when you run the diffusion, you find Zs that do not satisfy this condition. So we want to keep the diffusion staying within these good Z vectors that satisfy this. So how do we do that? We just literally add this term in the loss, right? So as we're running our diffusion, we say, okay, you do your, your conditional uh, reverse SDE, but we add this term in the diffusion uh, process. And then there was another idea that my students had, 
they actually said that when you're observing some pixels, this is an image, just to be clear, this is an image. D of Z is an image as you're reconstructing your process. And then we realize that when you're actually observing, when you're doing in painting, uh, you actually observe some pixels in the clear, right? Let's say in the noiseless case, to keep it simple. So the unknown piece of your image is this, but there's another piece that is actually observed. So instead of enforcing your measurements uh, through this term, which you can do, we're keeping that term, but in addition to that, we do what's called the gluing loss here. So we take this image and we replace the observed pixels, just stick them in there. So that's what this exclude is. Exclude is... You keep your reconstruction for the pixels you don't know, uh, but you actually literally copy paste the observed pixels for the pixels that you do know. So that's what this operator is just doing. And this is actually the new loss term that we end up introducing. Uh, this is like this term that I have here, but it's not using D of Z, it is using the glued D of Z uh, in the, in the, as the gluing loss objective. So this, adding this gluing loss objective term in the diffusion, Using stable diffusion, we don't change the foundation model at all. We just change the inference algorithm following my central dogma. Uh, we get uh, these reconstructions uh, that you can see here. Uh, and they're, they're very good. As far as I know, I think it's kind of the best method for, uh, for uh, in painting, but also solving other linear inverse problems. Now, again, if you wanted to do in painting, you could take Lion, start removing pixels, and train and in painter, right? Uh, of course, the problem is Lion is 5 billion images, so you would cost you a few million dollars to do that, but if you could afford to do that, train a supervised model for in painting, it would probably do much better than what we are doing. But again, we, don't, we can't afford to train an in painter on, on, a, on a 5 billion image uh, data set, right? That's kind of the, the key idea. So we're using pre-trained foundation models and a better algorithm. Uh, here is another example from our paper where we're using, uh, we're doing Gaussian deep blurring here on ImageNet, uh, which is out of distribution. Uh, and here you see this is, these are the blurred images. Uh, these are the ground truth images here. And uh, here, these are the observations. Uh, sorry, these are the reconstructions with uh, the DPS algorithm. And these are the reconstructions that we get uh, with our method. Uh, so when we compare our method to DPS, we see a very big gain. So we're comparing DPS to PSLD performance for random in painting. And now there's two aspects of novelty here. There's a new algorithm, but we're also using a better data set, right? So it would be unfair to compare DPS trained on FFHQ with our algorithm trained on stable diffusion uh, because st stable diffusion is just a much better uh, uh, generator. So we compare both for uh, doing DPS and PSLD on a small data set like, like FFHQ. And these are the results I'm showing here. So I'm trying to make a fair comparison, but of course we're still using a, a latent model, right? So still DPS is not, this is not what DPS was designed for. We're inspired by DPS, but we uh, kind of add an extra term to make it better in the latent space. That's kind of the innovation. So you can see that there's a very, very big gain here between the performance of our algorithm uh, compared to uh, running DPS. Uh, it's a very, uh, very significant gain coming from the algorithm. And in addition to that, we can plug and play stable diffusion as opposed to FFHQ. So this is our paper on this, uh, on this idea. Uh, and we also have a web demo that uh, many people are using. Uh, it's actually expensive for us to host this. So I think we have only a few GPUs on Hugging Face now. And I think most of the time there's at least one person running this. So, uh, you know, we could, we could try to scale this up. But I think many of the big groups and companies are going to be uh, introducing variations of this idea into, into the commercial tools. There's commercial in painters like Runway and Stable Diffusion and Midjourney. I believe all of them are going to be doing this uh, or a variation of what I'm talking about here. So, uh, the set, so this was the PSLD. Um, I'll talk a little bit about consistency. This is the second project, uh, mitigating sampling drift by learning to be consistent. And this is by Yanni Staras uh, and also Yuval and Kostis Daskalakis at MIT. And then uh, the ambient diffusion, I won't have time to get into, but I will. Uh, so what's the consistency uh, story? So as, as many experts here know, and uh, the, the true score function 
uh, is connected to the optimal denoiser by Tweedy's formula, right? So this is, you can either train for the score or train the optimal denoiser and you can go from one to the other. The problem is that in reality, you don't actually learn the real score. You learn the approximate score. And we, we realize that you can check how good the score you have learned is by running a consistency check. So you take the score you have learned, and that can be the stable diffusion score or a, a, a diffusion you train yourself. And uh, you can check the condition that, uh, that I'm going to show you. And you know that if your score was correct, that inconsistency should be zero. But we measure that inconsistency and it is not zero. And therefore that allows us to add a term in the loss. So it's a new term that's called the consistency uh, term that we introduce in the loss. And we show that by adding this new term, we get a little better performance. Uh, so that's kind of the, the idea of this paper. And I will explain a little bit more uh, what exactly we're talking about. But we do, uh, our paper was, as you can see, uh, the first version on archive was in February. Uh, now it has been submitted for publication. But after we submitted, we saw that there are many other, three, uh, <laughs> two other versions of consistency uh, that came out. Uh, and uh, this paper is, is called On the Equivalence of Consistency Type Models uh, by Lai and Takeda and, uh, and co-authors here. So this is our method, and there's two other consistency papers, but this consistency, this consistency, and this consistency are different forms of consistency that we realized, even though they're interestingly and deeply connected mathematically, as this paper shows, uh, the, they're actually solving different problems and they have different types of consistency. So I just want to clarify that there's related work that does something different. Our paper improves sample quality. So the consistency we are going to add improves sample quality. The most famous consistency, uh, as I know by Song et al, is improving sampling speed. So it's a different, uh, it's a different consistency loss and has a different objective. And the uh, Fokker-Planck diffusion consistency actually improves the performance of the likelihood. Uh, interestingly, these things that sound completely different seem to be equivalent or deeply connected, as shown in this paper that is very recent and I haven't studied it and I don't understand it very well. But we're all trying to understand uh, what is happening in this space. Uh, so I will, I will just briefly tell you about my consistency, and uh, I don't fully know what the other uh, two are doing. I know some of it, but I'm not going to talk about it. The idea of our consistency is as follows. You start with a noisy image, right? And you can run your, uh, your uh, uh, SD, your reverse SD, and you're going to go back and get an image. And you can run it again and get another image. And you can run it again and get another image. Now, you can average these three images, and you're going to get a blurry image. And that blurry image that you will get should be the same as running the denoiser with the input being x of t. Okay, that is the consistency term that we discovered. And we, we proved this, and it's pretty straightforward to realize that this should be happening. But, so this is, this is what we have written here. The consistency term is this uh, thing here. So it says, Take an image at any noise level and run your denoiser on it. You, get, you go back to, let's say, noise level zero, and that's a blurry image, right? Because if you're at a very high noise level and you run your denoiser, uh, the, this is the conditional expectation. It's trying to become the conditional expectation. And the conditional expectation, if you're very noisy, it's going to be a blurry image. At a t going to infinity, it's actually going to be the average of all your images. And then you run your uh, SDE multiple times, and you average the, the outcomes of those, and the average should be matching, in theory, uh, the, what your denoiser is producing. So starting, that's what I'm explaining here. Starting from xt, we denoise, let's say, all the way to zero, and we run the stochastic sampler multiple times, and the average image should be equal to the output of our denoiser, but it is not. So this is what we're showing in this plot. We're plotting here the, the gap between what the denoiser should be producing and what the denoiser is actually producing. And what you can see here is that as you go to higher noise levels, this is a very high noise level, there's a big gap between what the denoiser should be doing and what the denoiser is actually doing. So, 
uh, following the usual uh, dogma that I've been saying, let's just add this term in the loss and now just fine tune our model using this, this uh, consistency term. Okay? So that's the idea of, the, of our consistency paper. So these are three examples that my student produced. And, and he ran this on the EDM paper by NVIDIA, which is one of the best uh, diffusion code bases that we have found. Uh, this is kind of the baseline. The baseline images are here. These are generated cats. And these are generated cats uh, from our method. Now, um, okay, why are these cats, why is this cat better than this cat? Well, the eyes, as you can hopefully see here, the eyes of the generated cat with the vanilla EDM diffusion is worse than ours. Uh, here to the body of the cat, this cat seems to be flying out from the side, whereas our body is much more consistent. And here too, this cat seems to have a gigantic body, whereas our cat is uh, somewhat better. So these are just uh, some examples, but we measured this. Uh, and you can see that there is a, a small gain in FID by adding our consistency there. So this is kind of the, as we show, the consistency regularization fixes a few geometric inconsistencies and artifacts in the generated images. And we, we have done a, an ablation study for uh, seeing how much this benefit uh, uh, manifest itself depending on what T's we use. And the problem is also that our method is more expensive because you have to run the, the sampler multiple times uh, and the more times you run it, uh, the more you, you are estimating this consistency uh, better. And, and finally, just another idea, uh, just quickly, okay, how do you teach new concepts in an existing stable diffusion? Uh, this is a, th a third project. So a pre-trained stable diffusion, as you know, can produce a painting of a dog. But maybe you wanted to produce a painting of your dog. And maybe you have five images of your dog. I'm sure you have more, but let's say you only have a few. The key issue is how do we learn new concepts by having only a few sample images and fine-tuning this pre-trained uh, foundation model. Fine-tuning is, you need to be careful about how this is done exactly, which, uh, what, which layers and how they're fine-tuned. There is a lot of ongoing work in this space. It's related to dream booth and textual inversion, if you're familiar. But the key innovation of our method, which is called multi-resolution textual inversion, is that instead of uh, training one pseudocode word, as I will explain in a minute, we train a different pseudocode word for each level of the diffusion. So understanding how your uh, foundation model actually works is enabling us to do better fine tuning. So here is kind of the, the cartoon example of this. Let's say you have an image of me, and you can say, I want an image of XXX. Now XXX is going to be a vector. I would like to say an image of Alex Demakis, but I'm not that famous, unfortunately. So stable diffusion, if you say an image of Alex DeMarcus, it doesn't produce me. It doesn't know me. It knows famous people, but it doesn't know me. But I still want to teach stable diffusion how to generate me. Uh, so the simplest way to do that is you, this, these are vectors that are entering the stable diffusion uh, box, right? So I'm going to freeze. There's a vector for N, there's a vector for image, and there's a vector of uh, off, right? And basically, this is the clip text encoder here. So we're going to freeze everything. We're going to freeze these models, these weights. We're going to freeze the whole stable diffusion weights in the simplest case. And we're going to call this vector z. This will not be a real word. It will end up producing being a vector. So we call it a pseudo word. And we perform the compressed sensing with generative uh, models uh, algorithm. You do gradient descent in z, and this is z, so that the generated image minus the target image, which is me, uh, the mean squared error in the simplest case, or LPIPs in a better version, uh, n plus a mean squared error is minimized. So what this will learn is a vector which corresponds to me, right? And then I can take stable diffusion and ask it to produce a new image, like XX playing with cute dogs. And here are actual examples of this. So you can see it has learned to produce images of me playing with dogs, with cute dogs. And the other kind of interesting problem is that I have become everyone, right? Every person uh, on stable diffusion when you're, when, you're, when you're feeding a vector here is going to be me. So there's no way to say Alex DeMax is playing with Barack Obama. That, that's actually an open problem that the moment you do this, every person in the stable diffusion, um, it kind of overfits to, to a single person. 
And then you can also do XX as Agent Smith in the Matrix movie, and you can see I have become like Agent Smith, so I'm everyone in the, um, in the generated images. So this is kind of one way to learn a new world. And there's an additional trick that I'm, I'm, I don't want to kind of uh, dive too much into. I guess I can, uh, I guess I do have a little bit of time. So I can also tell you the extra idea for multi-resolution. So in the multi-resolution version of this, uh, we are not training one Z uh, across all noises, all noise levels, but we're going to change Z as the noise gets smaller, okay? So there's going to be a, 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 an Alex at high noise levels and an Alex at low noise levels. And by training multiple vectors, it allows us to do this idea of multi-resolution textual inversion. So here is what, the, what it produces. The input is multiple images from this painting. And what I want you to see is this painting is this famous painting, the girl with the pearl earring, but it is made by an artist who created the painting with buttons, okay? So this image has very interesting texture. So I would like to find you in stable diffusion so that it, it learns the concept of this image. We call this Jane. But we don't learn a single vector for Jane. We learn multiple vectors for Jane. So when you're actually saying now, now you're asking to generate a painting of a dog in the style of Jane, okay? So if you did just straight up uh, textual inversion, you're gonna get something like this. But if you, as you're changing which tokens you are uh, using during the generation, the diffusion process, you're able to get multi-resolution versions of this image. You can see this image has taken the high-level structure of the girl with the pearl earring, as you can see. It's still producing a dog in the style of the girl with the pearl earring, but it is not keeping the texture. The texture is kept when you do the full resolution, but here it only takes the high-level uh, features, but not the details. So given a few images, we learn pseudo words that represent a concept at different resolutions. And by doing this, we are able to do cool variations, separate basically the concept into its details and its high-level uh, views. Here's another example of this. Uh, we, we now learn two concepts. This concept is called Jane. And this concept, this is a toy cat that consists of buttons. Uh, this, th sorry, this toy cat doesn't consist of buttons. This Jane consists of buttons, right? This, this actually, I don't know if you can see them, but these tiny things are actual buttons. So this is the concept of a cat. So now we can generate images using stable diffusion where we say a photo of a cat at a low resolution made with Jane at a small resolution. So it produces an image of the cat made of buttons, okay? So we separated basically the fact that there, there are small buttons here and we're, we're accessing the details and we're accessing the high level structure of this image. So we're able, and everything here is done by stable diffusion. We're not changing the, the foundation model at all. We're just changing the diffusion and we're training different tokens at different resolutions. So that's kind of the, the main messages. So I'll wrap up conclusions. So. As I said, on the developing new foundation data sets, data comp is an, an effort that we're doing. Uh, if you're interested in, in that part, I'll be glad to talk offline or if you're interested in participating. It leads to better foundation models like Stable Diffusion and Deep Floyd IF. We hope to get better generators soon or we hope that the companies are going to use our data set and produce better generators. And as I, I'm repeating my dogma again, we separate the foundational model that learns the statistics of your images from how you solve your inverse problems, and that allows you to ride the improvement of the foundation generators. And uh, I want to say that this, this we did that with StyleGAN, but ILO, which was exposing intermediate layers of the StyleGAN and was only doing gradient descent in those, is, as far as I know, the first example of parameter-efficient fine-tuning using a foundation model, right? So that's kind of one thing that is related now to how people are fine tuning by not messing around with everything, but only exposing an intermediate layer and performing a little surgery in those intermediate ways. And ILO, this, which was a paper we wrote in 2020, I believe, uh, was uh, the, first the first version of that as far as I know. And this allows you, as we said, to ride the wave of improving foundation models. And I spoke about PSLD, which solves linear, linear inverse problems provably by posterior sampling with latent diffusions. And 
a method only works for linear right now. We're thinking about nonlinear, but we don't know how to do it. And this is our paper, if you're interested. Consistency is the second thing I said. How do you realize that there is a gap in the score learned and how to improve it? And you can do this or uh, fine tuning or uh, during training. And the ambient diffusion I didn't talk about, but the key idea is you do your training or your fine tuning from corrupted data. So you can add noise or delete pixels. We're doing it with deleted pixels. And very interestingly, it's possible to learn the distribution of clean data even if you are given only corrupted data. So this, th we had an earlier paper called Ambient GAN that was doing this with GANs, and now we, we found a way to do it with diffusions. And John, John's group also had a very interesting and related work that achieves a very similar objective with Gaussian noise, and it's using uh, SURE, as far as I know, and we're trying to merge our ambient diffusion with SURE. So, uh, and then I also talked briefly about multi-resolution and Dreambooth and so on. There are many challenges, and I think this is, you know, a great time for us to be working in these things. Uh, uncertainty quantification is obviously a very important problem. Another problem is reducing training set memorization. Some of these foundation models, with some prompts, it are possible to spit out images that are exactly in the training set. This is a very big problem, uh, and there's an ongoing, uh, excuse me, multiple ongoing lawsuits uh, against stable diffusion by Get Images, as you may know that uh, on relating to copyright. So uh, one way that we're realizing that we can reduce training set memorization is by ambient diffusion, by training on slightly corrupted images, still getting learning the distribution of clean images, but we found, as we show in this paper, that adding the noise in the training set uh, reduces memorization. And there's many, many other interesting problems. Uh, John said about, you know, there's protocols where you have multiple scans. How do you use them in your inverse problem solver? Uh, and how do you improve the diversity of the generated images and many others? So I will uh, end here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Does anybody have a question? Thanks for the nice talk, Alex. <clears throat> I have a question about uh, PCLD, uh, PSLD algorithm. Uh, the, um, in that algorithm, at each step, there is an encoder decoder ac activated. Uh, and then I guess, what's the trade off? So there might be a risk that if encoder and decoder are trained only on clean images, they will not give you correct guidance in intermediate states of the stable diffusion. Can you comment on that? Is this an issue or, or not? Or, yeah. Yeah, great, great, great comment. It's actually a good thing. It helps us a lot because that actually helps us tremendously because what's happening is you have an image, right? Let's say that you have a face and you're only observing half of the face. So you're not observing this part, right? Mm -hmm. So you're running your uh, diffusion and at some point in your diffusion, you're going to get some kind of other face, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now we run the gluing trick. The gluing trick says, you know what? You're actually going to copy paste this here, right? So you're you're not you're going to have a different face. So in the middle, you're going to have a line that is unnatural. So you have now correct pixels here and your guesses here. By autoencoding this, just by the autoencoder, it's going to smooth out this boundary, and it actually helps you very much. That's why the gluing trick crucially benefits from the autoencoder structure. So it's, it's very useful for us that the autoencoder smooths out the boundaries between the actual observed pixels and our guesses. Uh, uh, so that, that's actually a benefit in our, in our mechanism. I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. DeMarquis. Thank you so much for the fantastic talk. I also want to appreciate you sharing all this kind of very latest work. I also want to, following, want to follow this work on the PSLD. So I'm wondering that beyond the impending task, have you tried with like other tasks, for example, in the medical imaging, like the CT MR reconstruction? Uh, since for medical image domain, we are always like maybe work on the 3D or 4D data. So I guess I think this may be very helpful for using the latent diffusion. Great, yes, we haven't tried for uh, MRI. We, we have done it for in-painting and deblurring and various other kind of 
e, uh, classical like uh, um, in painting lines or variations of uh, linear inverse problems, but we haven't done anything on MRI. We have to say that stable diffusion out of the box is not necessarily a very good prior for brains. You probably want to fine tune it a little bit on brains or, or scans and then use it, but we haven't, we haven't tested that. Uh, so it's a very interesting research direction. Super interesting, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I also want to kind of like introduce our work with, with a very similar insight. It's called the resample and also on the archive of the Overseas Summer. Uh, we are also trying to solve the inverse problem through the hard data consistency with the latent diffusion. So very nice to see like the uh, almost like concurrent ongoing work in this community, which means that we're talking on some like important problems <laughs> that are attract people's attention. So we try something on the 2D CT reconstruction and the MR, oh, sorry, not MRI, but CT reconstruction. And we find what's interesting is that with the uh, auto encoder and decoder from the stable diffusion, even if we don't fine tune it, especially on the medical image domain, it can work well for the auto reconstruction which means that it has a very strong ability of the generalization uh, using the autoencoder. But I agree with you, like how to inject like the consistency into the latent diffusion is what very uh, challenging task and what also we are targeting on for now. Yeah, I'm very happy to see that you're sharing, sharing this week and also I'm very glad to know this work as well. I would like to also talk to you more offline to discuss that. Thank you, thank you. Please send it to me. I want to yeah. say that it used to be that I was able to browse archive, find all the papers, and keep track of what's going on. I am no longer able to, to do that. The, <laughs> the, the amount of work that's happening is, is mind-boggling. So that's why, I, I, please, do send me, please do send me your work. And, and uh, as I said, in the consistency space also, we wrote the paper, and then two other uh, papers came out. So we, we're not even sure if we should call it consistency anymore, because consistency means something else now. But, yeah, uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's definitely an extremely active space. Please do send me your work, and I'll, I'll be very interested in reading it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, same here. I'm also very glad to know this work that you are working on as well. I will drop you an email too with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have just one more question, and then we'll have our next speaker. Uh, hi, professor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So. I also have questions about the PSLD work. So I see in your paper you have a more complicated version of the objective. And it uh, has something to do with the gluing trick. But I see you also use gluing trick for tasks other than the in painting. You also yes. do that on super resolution or uh, deblurring tasks. But uh, the intuition is not very clear here. What does gluing mean in those other tasks? Yeah, so that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, question. The way we found the general version is, you know, you write the adjoint, right? So you say y, uh, sorry, x hat is a transpose y, right? So in, in the in-painting problem, this is going to literally uh, reconstruct the, the observed pixels exactly and put zeros on the non-observed pixels, right? This is kind of the adjoint, like a very silly <laughs> reconstruction. Uh, this corresponds to gluing, right, uh, for in-painting. But then another way of thinking about it is that this will give you a zero error in your measurement. So it perfectly explains the measurement. So now if A is not an in-painting matrix, but it's some other matrix, the algebra basically is still the same. So the way we found it is we wrote down the algebra for in painting, and then we realized that the same algebra works for any A. Uh, but I don't have, I mean, my intuition about what it's doing in another inverse problem like the blaring is it's going to uh, match the measurements. That's kind of one way I think about it. But yeah, we have a general form of the gluing trick that works for in painting and also works for any other A. Linear, linear, only linear. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. We can give him another round of applause.